Have you looked at the psychological impact of hormonal birth control on women? Is this something you've done much research on? Um, I have not looked at the psychological component of it, but obviously the downstream endocrine component of it, we deal with a lot in, in our female patients, um, especially as they, you know, those who have been on it for a long period of time who are then becoming perimenopausal. And as you're transitioning them to HRT, obviously one of the, uh, results of long-term, um, oral contraceptives is a significant rise in SHBG. So as their sex hormone binding globulin goes up and up and up, their free androgens go down for a given level. So you you kind of have this issue where even if they you normalize their testosterone or estrogen, they might actually be physiologically experiencing less of them. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, again, but definitely not something I consider myself an expert in. The... Uh, Dr. Sarah Hill wrote a book, uh, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. She's an evolutionary psychologist, but um, it's really wild. I, I think a friend has a, a great question, which is what is currently being ignored by the media but will be studied by historians? Mm. It's a nice frame of what are we kind of overlooking at the moment? And I really think that hormonal birth control will be one of those things that um, there was a recent Scandinavian study that looked at, you know, we've got this declining female mental health problem, especially among young girls. Like 40% of American teenage girls have persistent or regular feelings of hopelessness. Sure. It's like this real macabre, apocalyptic sort of language. And um, I always ask this question because I had Jonathan Haidt on the show and he was social media and comparison and blah, blah, blah. But I was like, how, has anyone factored in the base rate of what increasing levels of hormonal birth control usage has done to like, how much can this be contributing? And this- And has that changed significantly since 2010? Maybe, that's that's what needs to be looked at. Yeah, but- Because that's really, I mean, I think the argument in favor of Jonathan's argument is that when you look at the total takeoff or nosedive, if you will, of mental health for especially girls, mm -hmm. it, it coincides really perfectly with the exact introduction of you know TikTok, uh, not TikTok, but Instagram, smartphones, and 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 social media. So uh, unless there was a different so the, type of birth control, yeah. So that the gets question introduced. is, would there, was there also so one, um, a birth you, control change? Great question. Uh, I think I don't think that there has been a change. I think it's at anything. It's going to be kind of like just a steady linear adoption of of these of these drugs. But what you don't know is is there some sort of predisposition, some sort of psychological. Uh, um, raw materials that are more susceptible is this being able to magnify the effect mm. of social media of social comparison uh, and Dr. Sarah Hill's works so I mean it's fascinating the, the change that women have in the kind of partners that they go for both on and off of birth control uh, the um, level of testosterone that they prefer in a man's t-shirt at the same time the libido and the sexual uh, not only libido sorry uh, they're level of sexual satisfaction with their partner, which also is indicative of partner choice and how effective that is. And I mean, uh, you may or may not have heard these stories, but so many stories of women who get into a relationship with their partner when they're on, get married, decide that they're going to then have children, come off and are like, I'm not really that attracted to my partner anymore. You know, they sort of exit this hormonal fugue state hmm. and their kind of eyes are open and it's not hmm. a comment on their partner particularly it's just that they're in a, a very different hormonal profile now and what they find attractive is, has changed an awful lot it's wild i mean the research is is really really interesting interesting yeah i'm totally unaware of that side of things what about sun cream what's true about the safety of sun cream. I hear a lot of demonization of it, that it's dangerous, that you can put it on your skin, that it gets absorbed, that it turns into all of these things. But then also skin cancer, not good. What's your position on sun cream? Uh, I'm in the process of learning an insane amount of this for a podcast I'm doing. Okay. So I would, I would say I have my thoughts now, but they're, they're going to be updated by, you know, a team of PhDs. Check and, out the drive uh, in three months time. Exactly. So. When, when we get to do our AMA on this, we're going to visit really two questions that are both going to elicit a ton of controversy. So the first is, 
how clear is the uh, role of the causality of sun in melanoma? So again, that might seem like mm -hmm, a stupid mm -hmm. question to ask, um, but the answer is not entirely clear. Um, so what is it about the sun that increases the risk of melanoma? Is, is the risk of melanoma increased, for example, in sun exposure that does not result in a burn? Or does it have to result in a burn? Does it have to result in a severe burn? Does it have to result in a burn during a certain period of your life? All of this is unclear. Um, it's a lot more clear the relationship between sun and basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. I don't the, know what that the, is. They're two other types of skin cancer, but they're non-lethal because they can't metastasize. So, you know, to be afraid of skin cancer really means to be afraid of melanoma. That's the one that can kill you. Um, and so that's going to be the first part of the podcast is really exploring that relationship. And then the second is going to be the deep dive on all of the skin, all of the, uh, you know, uh, sunscreens out there. And so sort of mineral versus chemical and, um, what, what's, you know, to, to the best of our ability to understand it, what's the, what are the real risks, uh, if any of, of either of these types? Yeah. There's an awful lot of very vehement, uh, push in both directions. I think for this, I can, yes, imagine. I, I, I'm, I'm, we're, we're certainly not doing this cause we never do anything to sort of step in a pile of shit, but I, I, there's no question that this is going to be inflammatory, but what do you I think, think, what else would be, I mean, perhaps surprisingly, uh, talking about sun cream, uh, like, you know, real hot topic. It's a, you know, a war zone out there. What are the other, uh, really spicy areas that you might not have thought about? You start talking about pollen or something and it's, it's a, a, a real war zone. What is that? Um, I mean, anytime I talk about lipids and heart disease and, uh, dietary fats and stuff, anything to do with diet, that's always, that, that, that always tends to be quite inflammatory. Uh, because of course, you know, d anything that's diet related is sort of very tribal and, and religious. Um, I think HRT is a somewhat polarizing topic though, less so now than when I started talking about it. You know, when I really started talking about HRT, um, most of the medical establishment viewed it as bad and dangerous. And I think more and more the doctors are coming around to realize that, you know, the Women's Health Initiative was such a flawed study uh, that it's, you know, responsible HRT is a great thing for women. Um, uh, what else is really controversial? Look, I think, you know, vaccines. I did a, I did a, I interviewed a guy named Brian Deere and we went deep down the MMR causes autism claims. And that's obviously a very polarizing and controversial topic. In other news, this episode is brought to you by Marrick Health. When I wanted to get my blood work done in America, I asked around, I did a ton of research and Marrick Health came back as the best quality service that you can find. And I loved it so much, I reached out to the owner to actually partner with them on the show. They genuinely understand training, diet, supplementation, and pharmaceuticals. They don't want to make interventions you don't need. They will make suggestions that are minimum dose and appropriate for you and your goals and your age. They're great. It is literally like having a personalized bio health hacker in your pocket that understands you and your bloods at all time. You might've heard that I took my testosterone from 495 to 1006, and that was with the help of Marrick Health without using TRT, but by optimizing everything else that I was doing in my life. Right now, you can get the exact same service that I got by going to the link in the show notes below or heading to marrickhealth.com slash modern wisdom. That's M-A-R-E-K health.com slash modern wisdom.